last week's video was pointless, the one you just watched hammered the nail right on the head. I love the fact that Adrian told Rocky that she'd never seen him quit. Well, Mrs. Balboa, it's a nice thought, but I don't share your sentiment. Because right now we're all about quitting. Not quitting the fight, but quitting the things that keep us out of the ring. So far, um, we've discussed some very important things that we must, and I don't mind continuing to use that word. These are not optional. These are not things I can go home and think about. These are not things I can go home and pray about. These are not things that, you know what, it's a nice to do. I'll read my sermon notes later and figure it out. These are just things that are lying in the sand. You must stop them if you're going to live in a growing relationship. And by the way, we add with Christ on the end of that. This goes for everything. If you're going to live in a growing relationship in marriage, you must do these things. If you're going to live in a growing relationship as a parent, you must do these things. If you're going to live in a growing relationship as a friend, you must do these things. But it kind of gets really magnified when we begin to talk about our relationship with Christ. So, in case you missed the first couple of sermons, understand the first thing that we said we must quit is making excuses. And remember... What's our response to an excuse? Sorry, I'm all out of peanut butter. It's as good an answer as any that you can give to somebody that is making an excuse. An excuse is just you deciding why it's not important that I do it. And that brings to an interesting question. So how do I go about quitting making excuses? Well, I'm not going to go back to the whole sermon. Let me just give you the little summary. Make the thing that God wants me to do what I want to do most. You want to quit making excuses? Just make the thing that God wants you to do the most important thing of your life, in your life and all the other excuses, they go away. Why? Because the thing that you want to do the most is the thing that you always did. That's just how it works. So then, last week, we talked about this idea that I must quit complaining. Remember our response to complaining? Got any grapes? Because complaining is just about wanting things my way, and I just want somebody to make me happy. And the reality is nobody can make you happy. People that complain, again, they're not complaining about a thing. They're complaining just because they're unhappy people. And they're trying to force you into a situation of making them happy. And it can't be done. So I must quit complaining. And how do I quit complaining? Well, the summary for that, we need to remember God's way, not our way. What I want is irrelevant, it's unimportant, unless it lines up with what God wants. What I say how things should work, what I say how things should be done, if there's a biblical explanation for why we're doing it that way, fine. Otherwise, it's our opinion. And you know what? Everybody's opinion has the exact same value, and when your opinion isn't met, you don't get to complain about it. Because we are one body, one group. And so when we begin to look at these must things, I realize those are the two deep digs. And they're hard. And when we begin to think about them, they're offensive. And maybe they even upset us to think that somebody would have the audacity to stand up and say, stop making excuses, stop complaining, just do what God puts in front of you. But the thing is, the next one that we're going to deal with is very important. So so let's go back to the clip for just a minute. Rocky is a boxer. By the way, just so you know, you were spared. My original concept for this sermon was I was going to build a small boxing ring around the pulpit this morning. Um, But I had to go to Columbus, and I only had two days to work this week before I was on a plane, so I didn't have time, so we had to just settle for a pair of boxing gloves hung from the cross so that you understand we are climbing in the ring with our fear this morning. Isn't that why Rocky doesn't want to get back into the ring? For the first time in his life, he's afraid. And if you've seen the movie and you saw the beating that he took from from his opponent who was played by the infamous Mr. T, you understand why he's afraid because the man just beat him to a pulp. And I wouldn't blame him for not wanting to get back in the ring. But did you listen carefully when Rocky was talking about all of his things and all of his issues and all of his situations? He never mentioned his opponent. He wasn't afraid of his opponent. What was Rocky afraid of? He was afraid of losing. Huh? I didn't hear him say that. Really? 
listen carefully, because he went through how it was excuses and how it was Mickey and how it was he didn't want to lose, he didn't want to wreck his family, he didn't want to lose all this money. And when he gets back to it, and Adrian finally corners him, he, she says, okay, everybody thinks you can do it. He looked at her, and what did he say? And if I lose, you realize that's just like the flying, right? You can say you're afraid of flying, but really you're afraid of tight spaces, crowds, falling, there are other things, but it really isn't the flying that bothers you because the reality is an airplane ride is nothing much more than a bus. Sometimes a little bumpier, but it really isn't. But it's all those things that wrap around it. And you understand Rocky had wrapped all these other things around his fear, but the problem is, is um, he was just flat out afraid to lose. And you know what? That one I can relate to because I have told you guys in the past, I hate to lose. I'm not a bad sport. But I'm also not a very gracious loser. Okay? I will go down swinging if I have to. But you know what the problem with the fear of not wanting to lose is? You see, I begin to live in that fear. I begin to live in that fear that I don't want to lose. I don't want to, I don't want to not come up. I don't want to fail. And you know what the problem is? Um, sometimes, in order to win... <coughs> I have to lose. Isn't that what Matthew chapter 16, verse 25 says? For whoever wants to save their lives will lose it, but whoever, whoever loses their life will find it, their life for me will find it. So this idea that I can't just live in that fear of always not wanting to lose because sometimes for God's plan to work, I have to be willing to lose. I have to lose. Now, losing is one of my biggest fears, but you probably have your own, and they're probably wrapped in a whole bunch of things, but here's what you need to know. Those great big fears that you have, you know who else knows all about them? Your opponent. And those fears that you find yourself living in, he will use them over and over and over to continue to punch at you until, guess what? You're out the ring. You don't want to get back in. You're done with this fight. So this morning, we want to take a look at this idea of living in fear. And more importantly, I want to give you some weapons that you can use, some punches, some counterpunches, some techniques that you can use for overcoming this idea of living in fear. You see, you need to know this important fact. A life of fear does not come from God. This is what it says in 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. I will never, ever, ever be confused with a hellfire and brimstone preacher. And you know what? I'm just not a fan of, the, of that style. And this verse is the reason why. Um, this verse, by the way, was one of the first verses that I ever had to memorize. Um, the youth minister that plays such a big role in my life after I accepted Christ. This was the verse that he wrote inside the little Bible that he gave me. And I think it's because he understood me very well. He understood how much afraid I can be and how I can live in my fear. And he wanted me to understand this important fact. You see, um, God does not want to scare us into a relationship with him. That was never the intention. God does not want me in this relationship because of my fear, because I am afraid of what's going to happen. You know, we, call, we are called the bride of Christ, but God does not want a shotgun wedding. God does not want you into this relationship because you were forced, coerced, scared, and all of those kind of things, all of those words that we associate with. And you know what? If the only way I can get you to follow Christ is to hang you over hell, then you know, honestly, there's something wrong with my relationship. If the only thing I've got in the quiver, if the only way that I can convey to you that you need to have a relationship with Christ is to scare you, then you know what? There is something wrong with my relationship. I have missed something very, very, very important. When this verse was translated, the first time I just read it to you was in King James. That was the first English version that we have. When they retranslated it for the NIV, they changed that word to timid. 
And, and I like when they change that word because when I think about fear, it's kind of this big inaugural thing that, you know what, I have a hard time putting my finger on the concept of fear because i got a lot of fears in my life. You know, like I said, I'm not crazy about ladders. Um, I don't like to lose. I'm not really a fan of dogs, no offense to think the dog people. Just kind of not my thing. Probably had something to do when I was a child and just didn't work out for me. I, there are lots of things I'm afraid of. But being afraid of things doesn't always affect me the same way. But when I get to this word of timid, this word of timid means showing a lack of courage, confidence, or easily afraid. And I think that many of us have been scared into our relationship, and perhaps this is why we have such a problem sharing our faith with others. I think many people in churches today suffer from BCS. What is BCS? It's called battered Christian syndrome. It's where well-meaning people in the church or well-meaning ministers have battered you and battered you and bruised you and preached, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, to the point that we're afraid to open our mouths for fear that we're going to say something wrong and cause somebody else to go to hell. That's it. We find ourselves living in this concept of fear. And when I read that verse in 2 in Timothy, it says, But God didn't give me the spirit of fear. This did not come from God. God didn't make me timid. And if I look at that verse, uh, that, that definition of timid, it becomes important because this relationship that I'm living in shouldn't make me afraid. It should give me courage, according to Deuteronomy chapter 31, 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Every time I read this verse, I think back to the Wizard of Oz and the cowardly lion, and he was afraid. And what did he go to, what did he go to, 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 to the wizard looking for? Courage. Courage. Because that's how we overcome fear. It takes courage. And you know what? This relationship that I have with God should give me courage because you understand, sitting in my corner, sitting in the ring, this is why I needed my ring, in my corner is the creator of the universe. In my corner is a God that loves me so much that he's willing to die for me. In my corner, I have God. If that doesn't make you courageous, you know what your relationship gives you should give you confidence, according to Ephesians chapter 3, 12. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I don't have to come to God like I'm afraid. I don't have to come to God like I'm worried. I don't have to come to God scared. It's just that I can confidently come to God's presence, that I am free to come to God with anything and everything. Man, that relationship sounds a lot more fun than the one of just being afraid all the time. The one that I'm scared all the time. The one that I'm worried that I haven't done enough or that God's out to do this or God's going to do this to me. If I don't live the right way, this relationship sounds like it maybe is something a little more than we've made it out to be because this relationship should make us fearless. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20 says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak words may be given me so that I, I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, when I'm growing up as a kid, this concept of fearless worried my parents quite a bit because they swore I was born without a fear gene. I mean, they swear that there was just something not wrapped tight in Barry's brain that, you know what, I lacked fear. I would do things that didn't make good common sense or were not good decisions because, you know what, I wasn't afraid of the consequences. I, I just want you to know when he's talking about us being fearless, he's not talking about never thinking about the consequences of making dumb decisions. But what he is talking about is the fact that I can live fearlessly in God. I don't have to be afraid of God. And if you've ever met somebody that, that, that has a, a penchant to not fear, They'll do anything. They'll try anything once. Take them to a restaurant. They'll eat anything at least one time. They'll do this. We had a whole big show a few years ago called Fear Factor. Y'all remember this show? And they would bring people on here. And they, actually, I kind of think it was more gross factor. But, but you do understand that they would put people in situations that they were deathly afraid of, trying to get them to overcome their fear. And what was the incentive they gave them? Money. 
You can overcome your fear and you can win the game. And you know what? We'll pay you this exorbitant amount of money. And God is saying, you know what? I got something that's better than money. I'm offering you a relationship with the creator of the universe. But you understand this relationship is going to take care of some of your fears. It's going to make you a little on the fearless side. So we'll come back to that verse in a minute. But I want to play for a minute the game that we all like to play. It's called the What If Game. Moses played it. Now, we've been a, visited a lot with Moses this year. We'll visit a few more times with Moses this year. Exodus chapter 4, 1, we're back at the burning bush. And Moses answered. Now, remember, God had come to Moses, and he said, Hey, Moses, go down to Egypt. Tell the Pharaoh, let my people go. I don't sing as well as Ali. Okay, but, but we come, and, and, and Moses is supposed to go and tell the Pharaoh, give the Pharaoh these messages. And so he is looking at the mission, and I want you to pay real close attention to this. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you? Now, when Moses was called to go to Egypt, he was afraid. And I don't blame him. Moses was a wanted man in Egypt. Moses had committed murder and fled. Moses had already been told if they ever see him again, they're going to put him to death. He's going to have to pay the full consequence of what he did. So I would totally appreciate the fact that if God came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, if Moses had looked at God and said, "Um, God, if I go back to do what you want, I am putting my life at risk. Yes. That could have been a valid discussion. Just like if Rocky had looked at Adrian and said, I don't want to get back in that ring because this guy is bigger than me and he's stronger than me and he's younger than me and he's faster than me and I don't want to take the beating anymore. It would have been perfectly understandable if Moses said, I'm afraid, God. I'm afraid to go down there because I don't want to put my life at risk. And this is why I find Exodus chapter 4 of 1 so interesting because God, I mean, Moses never mentioned Pharaoh. When Moses was trying to explain to God why he didn't want to go, what do you say? God, if I go, what happens when nobody listens? God, I'm not afraid of Pharaoh, but going and standing up in front of those people and telling them that God came to me with a message, going up to those people and saying, God said do this, going up to these people and saying, what happens, Lord, when they look at me and they laugh at me? What happens, Lord, when they ask me a question and I can't answer it? What happens when they doubt me? What happens when I preach my heart out and I give everything that I've got for it and nobody listens to me? That's a big fear. That's a huge fear. As a matter of fact, that puts you in some very good company. Because if you look at the Bible, it's full of messengers that people didn't listen to. You've got Noah. Oh my goodness, the man preached for 120 years, started out with a congregation of eight, and you know what? He ended up with the same eight people. 120 years, nobody listened to Noah. But you know what? He still did God's will. He built the boat, got the animals, gathered the kitty litter, got the food together, and on his side mission, he was preaching the word of God all the way up until the day the boat closed. What about Jeremiah? Jeremiah. Man, he was sent to the people of God. And man, go look at the book of Jeremiah. It's one of the biggest books in the Bible because he spends an entire book trying to convince God's people to come back and do it God's way. And you know what he got for his trouble? Thrown in a pit and left for dead by God's people. By the way, we're going to spend the first month or so in 2020 looking at the life of Jeremiah and looking at the message that he gave to God's people. But nobody listened to him. What about Jesus? He said, well, people listen to him. Well, remember, he was sent to his own, and the Bible tells us his own rejected him. Uh, reject him, that's an understatement. Um, his own crucified him. See, this idea of what if nobody listens, God says, yeah, I know. I'm sending you into mission impossible. It's going to be hard, and it's going to be difficult, but here's what you need to remember. God reminded Moses, and by the way, constantly. This wasn't a one-time episode because Moses lived his whole life running back to God. like, God, they're not listening to me again. God, I'm giving them the message. And then these stiff, he calls them stiff-necked, neck, rebellious. They're not listening. They're doing it their way, God. God, I told them. And God said, I know, Moses. I see. 
Remember, I'm God. And this is not about their belief in Moses, him, but their belief in God. That's the issue. And you see, Moses just keeps getting reminded of this, and reminded of this, and reminded of this, and we need to remember that too. You see, Moses wasn't called to be the message. Moses was called to be the messenger. It isn't his job to get the people to follow. It was his job to deliver the message. And so after God was finished reminding him of this, he gave Moses a couple signs. Remember them? See how well you learned your BBS lessons. Gave him two signs. Do you remember them? First one's the easy one. Stick becomes a snake. Second one, Moses could put his hand inside of his thing, bring it back out, and his left wrist, put it back in again, and bring it back out, and he was healed. This was to show people that God was on his side. I want you to understand something. When we come back and we look at this verse in, in 1 Timothy, we get a couple of signs that we're supposed to be showing people. And by the way, they're not fear. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. And I want you to see exactly what God gives you. You want to make an impact for people? You want your relationship to grow? Stop being afraid and start showing God's power. Wow. Huh? What is it God's doing in your life? What is it God has changed in your life? What is it when God came into your life that changed immediately and you have overcome? You want people to listen to your message. Give them an object lesson. Show them power in God. Show them what God has done in your life. You say, well, I've got nothing to show. You've got a problem then. Maybe the problem is that, as we call it, your toaster's not plugged in. You know, you're putting the bread in, and you keep pushing it down, and the toast of the bread just keeps popping back up. You know what the problem is, right? For the toaster to work, what has to happen? You've got to plug it in the wall. You've got to be connected to the power source. And so maybe your entire problem, the reason you have to live your life in fear, is because you've yet to connect your life to the power source. But you do understand, once you're plugged in, that toaster will toast. And God will do things in your life. You know what else you can show them? God's love. Oh, my gosh. Do we miss this sometimes? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Basic verse. Most people know it. And you understand, it doesn't say so. For God so wanted us to be afraid of him. That's not how the verse starts. You see, this is all about God's love and compassion for humanity, not about us being afraid of what God's going to do to us. God is not the boogeyman. The image that we have of God, remember we talked about this in the 40 days of prayer, the image that you put in your head of God will greatly impact how you go about worshiping God. And you know what else? I thank Ollie for the song. I got peace like a river. By the way, you talk about overcoming fear. I don't think I would have done that. Nice job, Ollie. Thank you very much. Because you know what? That's nerve-wracking. I do this every single Sunday, and I still get afraid just before I get back up here. I couldn't imagine getting up here singing because it would be empty when I'm done because I don't sing. You sing much better than me, Holly. But you understand, um, you want people to listen to your message? Don't show them fear. Show them how you have peace in the middle of turmoil. How when everything around you is all chaos and the boat is taking on water and everybody is saying, jump, and you say, you know what? I don't have to because I've got God's peace in the middle of the storm. I've got peace like a river. It just kind of flows right on through me. And you see, because the, Lord, because the world is just seeing our fear, never seeing our power, our love, and our peace, it's no wonder that they're not listening to our message because we're living in fear, not in the way God intended us to do. Because the reality is there is nothing left fear. Psalms chapter 2, chapter 58 verses 2 through 4. My adversaries pursue me all day long and their pride many are attacking me. When I am afraid I put my trust in you in God whose word I praise in God I trust and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Now here's what I want you to understand. Everybody's going to be afraid sometimes. It's normal and it's natural. You know what? You want to? You don't think you're going to be afraid? Then come up here next week, and we'll give you a solo to sing. You know what? It can make you very afraid very fast. 
In fact, when you read through that verse, I want you to notice a few things. There are some negative promises that are made when it comes to fear dealing as far as the psalmist is concerned here. See, the psalmist makes some, press, some, some promises. He says we will have, have adversaries. All the days of our life, there will always be people that want to stop the cause of Christ. There will always be people waiting to bounce and pounce on you and examine your life and, and put your beliefs down. There will always be people that just want you to live in fear. Psalms promises that. You're going to have adversaries. You know what? The psalmist also promises you're going to be attacked. Of course, so did Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 12, The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Luke chapter 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. John chapter 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Matthew chapter 24, verse 9, Then you will be handed over and persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. You get it? There is always going to be somebody out there on the attack. You're promised that. So if you think that's your problem, then understand you're not, it's not going to get fixed. There's always going to be an opponent. And the other promise is, you know what? You're going to be afraid. Sometimes those opponents look big and scary. Sometimes those opponents, I don't want to deal with them. Sometimes those opponents, they just scare the socks off of me. And I just want to be afraid. And there's nothing wrong with being afraid. However, you don't have to live there. You don't have to live in that particular moment. You don't have to live in that rink of fear, afraid. How did Adrian say? Somebody's always going to be taking something away from you. And some people are going to remember you kindly. You don't have to live your Christian relationship that way. And in that verses that we read in Psalms, we get two very powerful weapons that we can counterpunch our fear. And by the way, when I put them up, you say, oh, we've talked about these already. Congratulations, yes, yes we have. Remember I told you, this sermon series builds off of I choose and the 40 days of prayer. And so the first weapon that we're given right there is we have to learn to trust God. Um, again, we've talked about this. This need for trust. This idea that we must surrender versus control. And for me to surrender, the first thing I have to do is I have to be willing to trust God. And I just want to bring these back to your mind. I know you've seen these before because we've had them on the screen within the last two months. For me to trust God, we must believe He is able. He has the power. We must believe He is available. He's going to be there. And we must believe that He's got my best interest at heart. That's the essence of trust. If I don't believe any of those things, then I cannot trust God. If I don't believe He's able, if I don't believe there's enough power, you know what? I'm going to live in fear. If I don't believe He's available, if I believe when I call out to God, He's going to say, oh, well, sorry, busy. Leave a message. I'll get back to you. If that's the way I view God, He's not. I'm going to live in fear. If I think God is always out to get me, then I'm going to live in fear. See, this idea of trust, it's a very big deal. I love the way that the psalmist put it. If I begin to trust in God, what can mere mortals do? Paul puts this out in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If I've got God, what do I have to be afraid of? Who's bigger? Nobody. Now, the other piece of the puzzle and the other weapon that we're given is this idea of praising God. And this is important because if trust allows me to look at God's overall history, his, his ability and his availability, praise begins to allow me to focus on his history with you, with me, as an individual. I begin to, to look at the idea that, that God has been there for me in the past, and therefore if God has been there for me in the past, then guess what? He'll be there today, tomorrow, and forever. First Chronicles chapter 23, verse 30 says it this way. They were, also, they, were, they were also to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. They would do the same every evening. Sound familiar? Man, I hope so. Because remember that daily habit of prayer that we talked about not four weeks ago? 
Remember how that day was supposed to start? We were supposed to get up with gratitude. I was supposed to get up and before my feet hit the floor, allow my knees to hit the floor and begin to thank God for all the things that he's done in my life. Begin to praise God for everything that he's done for me. If you remember how the day was supposed to end, it was essentially the same thing. It was the idea that I was supposed to praise God for, hey God, we made it through one more day. Ring the bell again in the morning because I'm ready for one more round. Because you know what? I understand. My trust is in you. And I'm going to praise you for it. And as we begin to look at this idea of trust, um, when I praise God, I remind him of all the things he's done in my life. Oh, wow. Everything. From the air I breathe, to the house I live in, to the car I drive, to the kids I have, to the job that I have, even though they drive me crazy sometimes, the job and the kids, sometimes the house. Everything. God has done everything for me to the sacrifice he made on the cross. I get to remember he promised, I don't have to live in fear. I want you to listen to this. I didn't put it on the screen because I really want you to listen to this. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want you to appreciate that list. It says that it doesn't matter whether I'm dead or alive, I can depend on God. It says it doesn't matter whether it's good angels or bad angels, angels or demons, there there is no spiritual power that can rip me from God's, God's hands doesn't matter about my past, my present, or my future. You know, it doesn't matter how you got here. You don't have to be afraid of that. Any powers, government, bosses, things that tend to pull you down, they're nothing to be afraid of. Height or depth, this is not scary of height, but you know how long your life is, how short your life is, how involved your life is, how stressful your life is. God says that can't separate you. And in case you miss anything, he says... Anything else in all creation, so not the puppy dog or the cat or the lion or the car or the house or the job, there is absolutely, positively nothing that stops me from from a life of freedom. Now, I want you to look at that picture of me, and I want you to think about that list because there's something missing from the list. See, there is one thing that makes the difference between a life of fear and a life of freedom. And you probably think, wait a minute, you cover time and you cover government and you cover family and you cover... What's left? Me. Me. You get it. I can choose to live in a life of fear. I can choose to look at God in a way that makes me look at him and say, God, I'm afraid of you, so I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. I can't allow my relationship because I don't trust you. The only thing that's not on that list that can come between me and God is me. Notice, even God was on that list. He said, I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to hang in there with you. But you do understand, I have the option. I get afraid, I can climb out of the ring. I can hang my boxing gloves up here on the cross and say, you know what, I am done fighting this fight. I've taken too many punches, too many blows. It's not worth it. I'm afraid that if I get back in that ring, something bad is going to happen. And God wants us to remind you. You get back in that ring, you're not getting that ring alone. So he never left it. He's just waiting for you to get back in. And I think too often times in our Christian walk, we're just flat out And we live our Christian life in fear instead of freedom. And you know what? The relationship stops growing. It becomes monotonous and boring and we just flat out get tired of it. That's a life of fear. The only question I have is, are you living it that way? Are you doing this church thing, this Christian thing, because... Somebody told you that if you don't do this, bad things are going to happen to you. 
or are you doing this church thing and this Christian thing because you know what? You have fallen in love with the person of Christ. There's a big difference. And you can look at your life and tell which one you're doing. It isn't hard. As a matter of fact, most of us can look at people and we can observe whether they're living in fear or whether they're living in love. Now, does this mean there aren't bad consequences? Of course there are bad consequences. There are bad, if I jump out of a building, there are bad consequences? Yes. Okay, You go splat when you hit the ground. That's just the way it works. There are consequences to not making the right decision, but you understand those consequences can't be the reason that I decided to end this relationship. It would be like getting married because I'm afraid that I want to, I'm alone. That's not going to end well. You want to get married because you're in love with the person that you're marrying, not because of what it's going to give you. So I want to encourage you. Stop. Quit. Don't live it in fear anymore. Live it out of the love that God loved you so much He gave His life for you. And in return you would be willing to exchange with him to say, you know what? You loved me that much. I'm not doing this because I'm afraid. I'm doing this because I want to show you just how much I love you for that decision you made. 